Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be your living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. and true and with thanksgiving I'll be your living sanctuary for you Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us at Grace. My name is Nate Nims. It is great to be with you this morning. And uh, thank you today, especially to Sean Mullen, who put together that prelude for us, singing and performing Sanctuary, because we are still this sanctuary together. Now, before we get to the rest of the service, let's take a moment of silence, just to center ourselves, to let go of all the worries and stresses and fears that might be weighing us down. And just take a moment to remember that God is with us and we are loved. So I'd invite you to take a moment of silence now, and then we'll say a prayer. And if you'd like, you can repeat those words after me. But let's, let's take a moment in prayer now and silence. God, you are the fount of every blessing. There are times when we are prone to wander, but your love always remains. Your grace continues to sustain us. Through this time together, Give our hearts and minds and spirits your peace. Revive us for your justice, joy, mercy, and grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now our reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. So our reading today is from Romans. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, it's been a little bit since I've been with you on a Sunday morning. Uh, last week, I was very thankful that we were able to join Bishop Deb Kesey and the superintendents of the state and our current bishop, Lori Haller, as they shared with us this hope of Easter that is still seeing us through. Um, maybe, maybe you've had this realization already, but it was new to me last week. Um, Sometimes people were saying, we've got so much more time now. We have so much more 
ability. We have so much more time to work with. And I realized the hours of the day haven't changed. What we, what we fill with them has, but the time that we have to work with, that's remained the same. Now, every now and then we need a pause, a reset, a moment to remember that our productivity does not define our worth or value as a person. And I was very thankful for the Sabbath rest and relaxation and recharge that the bishop gave us last week. So I hope you enjoyed that service. And this was a great way to follow up. Uh, and I'm thankful to Ben Campney that brought this to my attention because we're in the Methodist movement. And a Methodist bishop and a retired Methodist bishop spoke to us last week. And district superintendents of the Methodist tradition spoke to us last week. And you might be thinking, well, what makes them special? What makes this Methodist movement what it is? And today, May 24th, is what we call Aldersgate Sunday. It's the day where we remember and celebrate the moment in John Wesley's life that shaped him, that transformed his faith in a new way that allowed this Methodist movement to get started. So John Wesley is the founder of our Methodist movement that, that Grace here in Des Moines is a part of. Now, Wesley grew up in the Church of England. Wesley's father was a priest, and Wesley's mother taught a Sunday school class. Now, the interesting thing about the Sunday school class that John Wesley's mother taught is that at times, more people attended that class than went to Sunday services. There's an old and bad joke about a preacher and their spouse, and every time the, the preacher gave a good sermon, their spouse would put a dollar bill in a shoebox in the closet. But every time the pe preacher gave a bad sermon, their spouse would take an egg and put it in another shoebox in the closet because it was really a rotten egg. After a couple of years, the, the preacher wanted to see how well they were doing, and they saw that there were no eggs in the shoebox, but the box that had the dollar bills was overflowing. The preacher asked their spouse, am I really that good? And the spouse said back, no, I just felt bad about letting eggs rot, so I kept selling them for a dollar a piece. John Wesley's father was not the best preacher. In fact, at one moment in his ministry, the congregation was so upset with him, they tried to chase him away by setting the house on fire. As a pastor, I am grateful that every time people have not liked a decision I've made, they have not resulted to arson. So John Wesley grew up in this Episcopal tradition, and he thought faith should transform our lives, that what we do for this hour on Sunday should make a difference in every other day and moment of our lives, that this grace and love and justice and hope that we profess to should transform us. It shouldn't allow us to simply stay who we are. It should open us up to a whole new way of being. Wesley was captivated by this idea of holiness, by being set apart and inspired and filled with the Spirit of God so that he could make a difference in the world. Now, I'm sure no one has ever had this thought other than John Wesley, but he always wondered why someone could go to church on Sunday, but then be a jerk on Monday. Wesley knew there had to be a way for our faith to actually change us. And so Wesley started thinking about the ways that he could live out his faith, the practices, the methods that could make faith a part of his daily life, that would continually transform him. So John and his brother Charles and a few students at Oxford University, where John Wesley was a fellow, where he taught and uh, mentored students, served as a campus pastor, they started meeting together at a club. They started meeting and they formed this holy club. 
So together they would read the Bible, they would pray, they would study with one another. Twice a week they would fast in the mornings until three in the afternoon. And then seeing the needs of the community around them, Wesley and this holy club started to think, what can we do to help? Debtors' prisons were all throughout the uh, England at that time, and Wesley's own family had struggled with debt. So John decided, I am not going to cut my hair anymore, and I'm going to take all the money that I would have spent on haircuts and give it away to folks in need. Wesley started visiting people in prison. They started reaching out to folks, and this led eventually to the movement that we have now of schools and hospitals and care facilities and more. Wesley's personal faith was going to have a difference in the world, and that's why they formed this holy club. They came up with practices and methods and rituals and disciplines that would transform their lives. And every time they got together, they would say, how is it with your soul? They would ask, how are you doing? Like, really, how are you doing? And then the next week, they would remember what the folks had said before and said, how are you doing with that? How are, how are things moving forward? How can we better help you to not stumble like you did before? How can we help you see the strength that you have to get through this moment? Now, in those early days of the Methodist movement, John wrote in his journal that he had been charged with being too strict with carrying things too far in religion and laying burdens on myself, if not others, which were neither necessary nor possible to be born. Wesley thought that holiness had to be difficult to find. And so he rigorously strived for a religion that would achieve this goal that was not just outside of his reach, but outside of his ability to even grasp. He was very hard on himself. The practices and the methods and the ways that John and his friends were, were using for their faith, the ways that they prayed and studied and developed, they, they wanted to experience joy and grace and peace, and they had moments of that. But unfortunately, the ways that Wesley practiced his faith early in life mostly left him with feelings of guilt and shame and inadequacy. He forced on himself and on others an unhealthy legalism and guilt that made them feel like they were never good enough, that they had never done enough, that they would never be worthy of being the saints of God. Wesley constantly wanted to prove his faithfulness to himself and to others. He wanted to say, I am good enough, I am smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. But he just couldn't believe that about himself. Instead of trusting in the grace that he so frequently preached to others, he was hard on himself and even harder on others at times. He felt like he had to achieve the love of God. I doubt any of us have ever felt like we could never do enough, right? No one, no one has ever felt that other than John Wesley. And we, we feel like we aren't worthy, that we haven't done enough, that we haven't achieved enough, that we aren't good enough. We imagine that we can be separate from the love of God because we just can't believe and trust that it's already with us because we know all those things that we could do more. In this moment, you know, two months ago, some of you became teachers and co-workers and chefs and coaches and custodians and more all overnight, all without leaving your home as well. Our roles and our responsibilities and our ways of life have drastically changed. And I can't be the only one that first thought, in this moment, I can have it all and more because I've got so much time to work with. 
How many of us have struggled? How many of us have strived for an unreachable ideal of perfection instead of extending to ourselves and to others the love of God that is already with us? It was Wesley's quest to be perfect, to prove that he was faithful enough, that he was good enough, that he was smart enough, that he was truly striving for grace that made him feel like he could give no grace to himself. He wrestled with these feelings for so long that eventually he left his position as a fellow at Oxford to travel to Georgia to be a missionary. Now in 17. 17- 32, the British Empire established this new colony in North America, and it was named Georgia in honor of King George II. Not to be outdone, King George's wife Caroline had two colonies named after her shortly thereafter. Now, James Oglethorpe was a member of Parliament at a time, and they were a bit of a social reformer as well. So as I said earlier, John Wesley stopped cutting his hair so he could give money to people that needed it because debtors' prisons were a growing problem in England. Oglethorpe realized that if people were in jail for debt, they couldn't go to work. And if they couldn't go to work, then they couldn't repay the debt. So what good was the debtors' prison? Oglethorpe thought, let's take some of these folks that are in debt And let's send them to Georgia. Let's send them to this new colony that we have where they can have a fresh start, where they can start over again and have a second chance. So after a few years of seeing people start these new lives in Georgia, Oglethorpe returned to England and sent out word that they were looking for priests. They wanted pastors to come and help the people there, but they also wanted these pastors to reach out to the indigenous people in the area and try to maintain peaceful relationships with their neighbors. John felt like this was the perfect moment for him, and so he left with his brother Charles and a few other friends to go to Georgia to embark on this new adventure in the new world. But on their way, Wesley Wesley had another motivation. Wesley said in his journal that he went to Georgia to save his own soul. Now remember, at this point in Wesley's life, he was a fellow at Oxford. So he was a pastor, he was a professor, he was a guidance counselor. He was someone that grew up as a pastor's kid. Wesley had devoted his life to the church, starting the holiness club that people said, you folks are taking religion way too seriously. And Wesley leaves that life behind to go to Georgia because he doesn't think he has any faith at all. But more than that, in that moment, Wesley thinks, how could God love me? I couldn't prove it in England, so I'm going to prove it in Georgia. Wesley didn't think that he was faithful enough. What Wesley preached to others, he could not believe about his own life. One scholar and historian, Richard Heisenratter, noted that before traveling to Georgia, Wesley had never been on a boat before. Wesley was so anxious to get to the new world that instead of ever being on a boat, he got on a ship and sailed across the ocean, and you can bet he did not have a good time because of that. Wesley was seasick more often than not in the three-month journey from England to Georgia. There's a passage in the New Testament where it says that we work out our faith with fear and trembling, but seasickness is not what they had in mind. Wesley was just sick and miserable, and in his own head thinking, what have I got myself into? It was on October 14th, 1735, that Wesley boarded the ship to cross into the New World. Three months later, they would arrive, but those three months were miserable and uncomfortable, and there were a number of storms that shook the boat as well. And those storms, they shook Wesley to his core. 
There are a lot of storms that we face in this life. There are a lot of moments where we feel like Wesley shaken to our core. And I cannot and I will not believe in a God that sends those storms to us to punish us or hurt us. And yet, I find hope in the God that sees us through these storms, that is there with grace and peace to pick us up, dust us off, and remind us that love is still ours no matter what. Wesley faced those storms at sea, and those storms just ripped open his soul. Now, a lot of the storms that we face in life, they are not literal, but they are just as frightful. Our, at times, our life, it, it feels like we get thrown off, that we were off course, that we are tossed here and there. And these tragedies and these uh, moments that come to us, they don't have to destroy us. And God doesn't send them to us. God does not hurt us or harm us. God lifts us up. God gives us grace and peace. God reminds us love is already ours. Now, I will never claim to know why bad things happen. I don't know why those storms in our lives come our way. Pain, when it is not your pain, can be an interesting philosophical concept to wrestle with. But when the pain is yours, when it is intimate, when it is what you know, it's just an all-encompassing mystery that you feel trapped under. I don't know why bad things happen to good people or why good things happen to bad people, but what I do know is that we are in a real world with real possibilities, and that means real pain can and does happen. And because that happens, we have to be the people that rise up, that stand up with and for one another. I don't know why terrible things happen, but I do know that the people that have been touched by cancer are often the folks that start cancer fundraising and research organizations. The folks that have been hurt but have found a way forward can stand up and say, Hi, my name is Nate. I'm here to help. They can say, Me too. And in all of these moments, we can realize we are not alone, we are not lost, we are embraced, and we are loved. God doesn't hurt us, but through us, God brings healing to a hurting world. On January 25th, in 1736, Wesley wrote a note in their journal about a storm that they had experienced while they sailed across the Atlantic. During the storm, the, the sail was in tatters. It was a mess, and Wesley was shivering in a corner, afraid and alone. But there was a group of people that were praying. There was a, a group of Christians from Moravia, a small part of Germany. They calmly sang psalms while the boat was rocking to and fro. Wesley wanted a faith that could sing through the storms. He wanted the peace that he saw in those Christians from Moravia. And when he arrived in Georgia, instead of living with that peace, seeing it in them and accepting it for himself, he doubled down on his rigorous and ritualistic understanding of faith, saying, you have to do it this way or you get nothing. So just after the ship landed on the shores, they had been carrying a lot of rum with them. Wesley confiscated all the rum and then destroyed it because Wesley knew the people on the ship were planning a party and he thought, I am not going to let them enjoy it that much. John Wesley crashed this party before it started because he did not know how to win friends or influence people. When Wesley started his ministry in Georgia, he advocated for this rigorous practice of faith. And some people embraced it, but most did not. One thing that Wesley said 
to his congregation was, we're going to start holding a prayer service every day at five in the morning. And if you don't come to that prayer service, you don't get to take communion. That is not going to be a practice that we embrace (laughs) at grace. Right? Like Wesley thought God's goodness was only available to the early birds, that you had to achieve it, that you had to strive for it, that you had to, in my opinion, thinking about being up at 5 a.m., punish yourself in order to find it. Wesley was so caught up in his ideal of holiness that he forgot what it means to be holy. As it's described in the New Testament, when Paul writes of the fruits of the spirits in Galatians, Paul writes that holiness means that we are filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wesley was known more for being judgmental, for being cruel, than he was for being filled with love or joy or peace or patience. Sadly, Wesley was not the last Christian to be known for more of that sort of rigorous and angry faith than he was for being known with justice and joy. Now, throughout the spring of 1736, Wesley did not scare everyone out of that church in Georgia, just most of them. There was a small group in that church that remained that would study and pray with Wesley, that would come together and celebrate their faith. And one person in that group was named Sophie Hopke. Now, Sophie was 18 years old when she met John, and she had previously been engaged to someone that was now in jail for forgery, but John was an eligible bachelor and a new preacher in town, so she thought he might be a real catch. There was one catch, though, because John was 32, so they didn't have a ton to talk about, but they still found a friendship. Now, Wesley and Sophie started to become closer and closer friends, and while this happened, John wasn't sure that marriage was him. Marriage was was for him. So Wesley would tell that to Sophie, that we can be friends, we can be close, we can be courting, as it seemed like they were, but Wesley said, I don't know if marriage is for me. But Sophie thought, you're my best shot, I'm going to stay with you, and so Wesley wanted to be in a relationship, but his journals throughout that summer just show this inner struggle of wanting to devote himself fully to the church and wanting to spend time with Sophie as well. That summer, Sophie kept thinking she was going to get engaged. See, she thought that John was on the verge of asking her to be his wife, But by the fall, he still had not put a ring on it. So one day, John finally said to Sophie, I need to stay single so I can devote myself to the church. And Sophie said back something like, Well, what if I stay single with you and we focus on the church together? What Sophie thought that meant and what John thought that meant were very different things because Sophie thought, all right, I got the hook in, I can bring him along and it's just a matter of time till we get married. Wesley thought, finally, I have someone that wants to be single with me for the rest of their life. They didn't really communicate that well and eventually Sophie's family came to John and said, either you get engaged or Sophie will marry someone else. John didn't think that would happen. Shortly thereafter, though, Sophie was married and Wesley was devastated. He wrote to Sophie telling her that she had lied to him, that she had sinned against God and the church, and unless she stood in front of the congregation and confessed to every way that she had wronged him, she would never be able to receive communion again. But Sophie, Sophie didn't think she had done anything wrong. And that's because she really didn't. 
She didn't do anything wrong at all, but the next Sunday, they had communion, and Sophie and her new husband walked up front, and they were refused. John Wesley held back the elements from Sophie and her new husband and said, it's not for you. You're not worthy. You're not accepted. You're not loved. Go to the back. Sophie and her new husband charged Wesley with slander and defamation of character, and they had a pretty good case for it. Eventually, John was even in jail over this charge. Eventually, he was let out on bail, and the next couple of months passed by like a really bad soap opera, with court procedures moving slowly and people in the town and in the church picking sides between Wesley or Sophie. Wesley, he was, he was devastated in this moment because he felt like he lost his faith in England. Then he lost it even more at sea, and he thought he had it for a moment, but then it was all gone. And the pain and doubt and anger that he felt in his life just left him feeling devastated. He was lost and alone and lost his faith that year in Georgia. He had a friend, though. Uh, his friend was a pastor named Peter Bowler. And Wesley, he, he left Georgia in the middle of the night, ashamed and alone, and sailed back to England. And when he arrived back in England, his friend Peter was there waiting for him. Wesley was ready to leave everything he knew behind, to give up on faith, to let go of the church, and just walk away from it all. But his friend Peter came to him and said, Preach faith till you have it, and when you have it, you will preach faith. Wesley wasn't sure about that advice, because he had been preaching faith for a number of years by now. But Wesley took that advice to heart and started to think more and more about the faith that he was preaching and if that faith was what God had in mind for us or not. A few months after that, at a house on Aldersgate Street in London, a group of friends were meeting together and encouraging one another in their faith. They were spending time with one another. And we don't know exactly what happened that night. But we know it changed Wesley forever. In Wesley's journal, he writes, in, every, in that evening, I went very unwillingly to a house on Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he described the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given to me that God had taken away my sins, even mine, and God had saved me from the law of sin and death. I then testified openly to all there what I now felt in my heart. Wesley realized at a church meeting he first felt unwilling to go through that he was loved, that he was accepted, that grace was his. No matter what he has done, no matter what has been done to him, Wesley felt this love fill his heart and it was strangely warmed with this grace, with this joy, with this hope, with this love that changed everything. <clears throat> the practices and the methods and the ways that Wesley cherished and used up to that point to foster his faith, they were important, but they were no longer the point. The point. The only point that mattered was this grace of God that Wesley now knew was with him and with us all. You are loved right now, no matter what. 
You are accepted, you are cared for, you are welcome, you are never turned away, you are never alone, you are loved. And this love is with you always. This love is never closed. This love is never going to leave you. You cannot step away from it. It is for you because God is with you. Or as it says in Romans, Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. May your heart be strangely warmed. I know there are reasons to feel like we're not doing enough, that we don't even know what to do. In this moment, it's not just that we can sit down and watch Netflix and relax. There is this loss in the air and an anxiety in all of our hearts and we're never sure when it will be done but what we can be sure in is this love that is yours that is ours that will not leave you that god's glory and hope is with you that god is not hurting us god is not punishing us God is not teaching you a lesson and saying, this hurts me a lot more than it hurts you. God is love and love is on your side. The 20th century theologian Paul Tillich expresses it like this. It strikes us when, year after year, the longed-for perfection of life does not appear when the old compulsions reign within us just as they have for decades, when despair destroys all joy and courage. Sometimes, at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying to us, you are accepted, you are accepted, you are accepted by that which is greater than you. So don't try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything. Do not perform for anything. Do not intend for anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. After such an experience, we may not be better than before. And we may not believe more than before, but everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf between estrangement. I love how Tillich expresses that tension that we saw in Wesley's life, and when we're honest with us, ourselves as well. We are accepted. You are accepted. You don't have to intend more. You don't have to believe more. You don't have to strive more. You are simply accepted. You are loved, and that love will not let you go. There is nothing you have to do this week to achieve that love. There is nothing that you have to do to lose that love. Nothing can let that love let you go. You are accepted, you are cared for, and the universe is on your side. That is why this day means so much. Because it's a day where we can remember whatever storms have shaken us, whatever losses have felt like they got the last word, grace is still with us and for us, and nothing will stop grace from coming our way again and again and again, because you are accepted, you are loved, and that love will never let you go. So just as God has accepted you, may you accept yourself. May you live with this grace and peace now and share it wherever you go 
with whomever you interact with because you are loved, you are accepted, and your heart can be strangely warmed by this grace of God that is always with us and with everyone else as well. There are a number of prayers that we have to lift up and share this moment. We have a few members of our congregation that are currently in the hospital. We have folks that are recovering from diagnoses, and we have folks that have been recently diagnosed. We have all sorts of worries and anxieties and fears, but at the very same time, we have hopes and dreams and joys and moments that fill us with such love, like new grandkids and new great-grandkids. There has been so much to be thankful for, just as there has been so much to weigh us down. But as we saw in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminds us that God already knows what we need. In the comments, if there is a specific prayer that you want to bring up, you can do so if you're watching with us on Facebook. Feel free to type in those prayers and interact with those prayers with one another. But let's come together now in a moment to pray and remember God already knows, God is with us, and God's grace will never let us go. Let us pray. Loving God, you know our hearts and souls. You feel what is within us, and you can express even what we cannot express to ourselves. So we ask that your spirit might bring us peace in this moment, that through the storms of our lives we might know your grace, that this faith that we preach and proclaim to others we might accept for ourselves. God, may our hearts be strangely warmed. May we remember in this moment that your love is with us and your love will never let us go. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to achieve it. We don't have to work for it. We simply know that you accept us, that you care for us, that your grace and peace will lead us and guide us all of our days. So as your grace is with us, may we extend that love and mercy, that justice and joy to ourselves and to one another. May we be transformed so that we live into these fruits of the spirit of peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Guide our hearts and minds. And in these worries and anxieties that we have, may we remember that your love will get the last word. All this we pray through Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning at Grace and for being a people of grace. For the ways that you are reaching out and caring for one another, the ways that you are looking after your neighbors and taking care of yourselves. Thank you. We need to be a people worthy of being called grace, which means just as we give to others, we have to give back to ourselves and accept that we are accepted, to accept the rest that God offers to us. So if you need rest, if you need to relax, you can. Take a breath. It'll be okay. God is still with you and God is still with us all. The ways that you love one another are an offering to God, and it makes all the difference in the world. And if you want to make an offering to our church, one of the best ways that you can give to Grace right now is by giving online. You can go to our website, gracedemoines.org, and click on giving there and set up a recurring gift or a one-time gift. Either helps us. 
and the gifts that you give back of your time, of your energy, of your care, of your devotion, the ways that you live this faith out, that you ex- extend the acceptance that God has given us to one another, that is just as much of an offering as well. So thank you all for your support and your care and the way that you care for one another because it makes a world of difference, not only in our church, but in this world. As we come to a close, I thought with our opening prayer, we should wrap up with Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's one of my favorite hymns, and I hope it's one of yours as well. This week uh, online, we're going to share a different version of Come Thou Fount. It's performed by the band Mumford & Sons. I know it's a little different than our church choir singing, but in this moment of internet experimentation, we're trying some new things. And so may our hearts that are prone to wander be bound to God's love. And may you know you are accepted. You are accepted. May you accept just how accepted you are. God is with you. Grace is on your side. And you are never lost because you are always loved. So may our hearts be bound to that fount of every blessing now and always. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you can join us next Sunday for Senior Sunday. But until then, let's join our hearts and maybe even our voices in song with the the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Sing the
thy grace Streams of mercy Never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy unchanging love.